I'm Scott Isle Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today I'm going to talk about the one statistic that we have to compare different countries or regions or parts of the world that you can't hide from. In most statistics, there's information that we have to dig very deeply into behind how it is collected. And we have to wonder, uh, for example, if someone has good health care and another country says it has bad health care, well, how are they comparing? They don't have necessarily really good direct comparisons between them and we're getting very subjective, but there's one statistic that is outrageously objective and is nearly impossible to have skew in any way and gives us some insight how to the people who live in a country feel about their own overall value of their life in that country. And it's really worth looking at because I think it tells us some things we may not realize otherwise. So we're going to get to that right after the bump. Statistics are generally boring, but if I put it in just the right way, maybe, maybe we can get a little bit of clickbait out of it. But what we're talking about, the one statistic, the one thing that reduces human life to absolute objectivity and gives us an insight, how do people are feeling about themselves? This is something that is far more comparable between countries than nearly anything else. And that is quite depressingly, their suicide rate. Suicide rates reflect the percentage of the population that has simply given up. It doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter how good your health care is, it doesn't matter how many economic prospects you have, whether you have unemployment. At the end of the day, all of that comes together and people make a decision whether this life is worth continuing. And that decision is absolutely final and is not something that is subjectively described to a third party. No one's filling out a survey and no one is reading into other events. We have one singular event that is incredibly definitive and reduces human life to an objective number. And while that's very unfortunate, it's an important number to look at because it gives us an insight that nothing else will actually do. When we look at things, for example, which are super important and I'm not in any way discounting them, like the human happiness index, that's a great indicator. That's a great way of looking at the world. We want to make our populations happy. But when you take someone who lives in one country and you take someone who lives in another country and you ask them to rank a bunch of things on scales and give an idea of their happiness, it's very subjective. The way that they portray it is partially indicated by how they view other countries. Well, I'm not super happy, but I imagine if I lived in that country, I'd be happier. That makes you score yourself lower or things like that. It's a dangerous way. While it's important to collect and it's probably reasonably accurate the way that they do it, it still leaves a lot of interpretation. Nobody gets to fly around the world visit every country and spend a lifetime in them at the same time and experience exactly what it's like. Plus, within a country, there's so many variables. One person could be unhappy while 99% of the population is thrilled with things. So we have to look at just big statistics and it can be very dangerous. And, and suicides, while there are still factors that go into suicides, they're generally much more predictable and they're certainly more definitive. When you're looking at suicides, you're looking at populations who absolutely have given up. They do not hold any hope for the future, and it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it takes those factors out with other indicators. We have a tendency to include things like how wealthy you are, which could make you happier, but isn't on its own happiness. They could make you safer, but on its own isn't safety. And it goes on and on. Suicides are so much more definitive, and so they tell us a lot. I also want to point out, it is really common due to a number of factors, one of them being proximity. The United States and Nicaragua sit very close to each other. The United States has also occupied Nicaragua for a very large percentage of its history. And during the time that it has not been occupied by the United States, much of that time it has been antagonistic. And we deal with, very commonly, a lot of propaganda coming out of the United States that says that Nicaragua has a lot of problems. And Nicaragua has its problems, to be sure. It is a very poor country, has a huge lack of employment. It has a lot of things that it just can't do for its people. And that's real. But other countries have their problems as well. Everyone is different. And so we have a tendency to compare the United States and Nicaragua because so often, the picture of Nicaragua is being painted by the United States or by people who are in the United States and done so as a comparison to the U.S. Well, Nicaragua is so poor. 
because the United States is so rich. The, Nicaragua does not have access to these markets, but the U.S. certainly does, and so forth. And so it's important for us in Nicaragua to often have a picture of how we compare to the United States because it's the strongest comparison made against us on a regular basis. It is also important to compare against our regional neighbors. How are we doing versus Costa Rica or Honduras? Those are places that share our weather, our climatic events, our, our earthquakes, our building uh, supplies, our logistics hubs, our populations. So we're important to compare as well. So just we like to have these different things. And it's important to compare around the world. But Nicaragua and the United States have a tendency to come up head to head competitors in comparison all the time because that is what so many people who live here and are making a decision, but I'm being told I need to go to the United States, or Americans, well, I wanted to retire, but I'm being warned about problems in Nicaragua. These direct comparisons apply to so many people, and for those who it does not directly apply to, often it is a very good indicator, because you're, if you're watching this channel, for example, you're probably very familiar with one or the other or both, and so having some of these numbers as a comparison is very, very useful. Wow, that's a lot of context. Let's dig into these numbers. So. On Wikipedia, they don't have absolutely, and no one ever does, right, perfect numbers that are all from the latest year. So the numbers trail a couple of years. Not a big deal. These are not the types of things that have huge skewing trends. Of course, during COVID, we saw numbers go much higher, but that was across the board. Uh, we're not going to look at COVID numbers. Uh, these are uh, actually pre-COVID numbers, but just, just before, so they're still very much in line with what things are today. Uh, neither country had really dramatic events since then. The U.S. has had a little bit more dramatic. We could... In theory, have an uptick in the United States. It's not expected. Uh, and you can check numbers coming before and after. It, very few countries have very large changes uh, in suicide rates unless you're looking at war or something. When we're looking at the worst countries in the world, this is, this is very tough, right? These are countries that have really high rates. Most of the very, very, very highest are going to be extremely poor, uh, impoverished nations, right? Not just poor, but, but lack of access to resources with very bleak future outcomes, places where uh, they have no societal supports. When we're looking at the places that are best, often they're very small countries that are able to identify in very small uh, populations, which is really interesting that it is perhaps having very small social groups, not small, as in not having many friends. That would be a weird thing to draw from this, but meaning small communities where we're really able to know each other, where we have more interpersonal contacts throughout our, our vertical chain of society. Uh, and I'm just drawing conclusions, but the number of the most low suicide rate countries that are absolutely tiny and often islands is really surprising. But once we take those out, then we look at the real numbers. So let's start with the comparison of the United States versus Nicaragua. We're looking at country rankings. Nicaragua comes in at 145. That means there's only about 40 countries who have lower suicide rates than Nicaragua. This is really good. Nicaragua ranks very, very well on this ranking. Certainly not the best. It's actually really noticeable that Panama beats us by a bit. And Honduras absolutely crushes us at far less than half our rate. That's amazing. You go Honduras. Honduras is almost, well, certainly the best here in the region, but if you expand the region just a little bit of major countries, again, the tiny islands, Barbados, and those kinds of places, they're, they're the best. But when we come to major countries, by far, number one is Venezuela with the lowest large country suicide rate in the world, which is really interesting when you compare it to the highest suicide rate in the world of any country anywhere, regardless of size, region, or anything else, is their direct neighbor of Guyana, the country that the two are fighting over the Essequibo. We've had a couple of episodes where we've talked about that. This is actually really interesting juxtaposition that two Caribbean nations directly sharing a border that are fighting over a shared region. One is viewed by its own population as the greatest despair on the planet and the other as the least, except for some, for some few isolated Caribbean islands that are right off its coast, right? So it's Venezuela and those the Lesser Antilles is really where you're getting the absolute best numbers. But just a little bit after that is like Honduras and Panama and Central America. So the Caribbean really leads the world in a lot of ways, except for Guyana, where we have the absolute worst, which makes you wonder if being in such close proximity to places that are so happy, where people are just so full of the, the hope for the future of life, 
maybe being in such close proximity, but having such an absolutely different experience creates a situation in Guyana that makes them a lot more depressed than you would get other places, purely hypothesizing. But being a member of the Commonwealth in that Caribbean region makes them absolutely different in so many ways from their support networks to their culture to their racial backgrounds. Everything is completely different there. And so whatever trends we're seeing that in the Caribbean that, that seem to make these really low rates may not apply there at all. So we would be tempted by looking at the Caribbean to say, well, maybe it's sunlight. Maybe there's just more sunlight and that makes people happier. In that region, Guyana has the same sunlight that Venezuela does and the two couldn't be more different. So Nicaragua sits at 145th highest country for suicide rates. That means there's 144 countries with higher suicide rates than Nicaragua and only about 40 with lower ones. Looking at the United States, the United States is the 31st highest suicide rate in the world. Now, remember, every little country is included. So most of the countries that are higher suicide rates in the United States are very small, very poor, underdeveloped countries. Notably, with higher suicide rates in developed countries, higher than the United States, we only have Russia, South Korea, and Uruguay, which really stands out as nothing like anything else in its region. These are the only ones with higher suicide rates in all of the top 31 countries. Only those four are large developed countries. And you can argue that Uruguay, while highly developed, is anything but large. And South Korea is not that large, but is certainly a very large population. And so must fall into the same category as Russia and the United States. But these really stand out. There are extremely few developed countries with all the resources economically and jobs and medical and all those things that fall into those categories. Now, Russia has been at war for a long time. I'm sure that that puts it into a tough place. South Korea, we also see huge population drops uh, in other ways that they're just not having children, which of course could be very well connected to high suicide rates. So something is going on in South Korea for sure. But with well more than 100 countries sitting between the United States and Nicaragua on the rankings, the suicide rate in the United States is dramatically above 300% that of Nicaragua. That tells us a lot in all the marketing and all the things that we get from different places around the world of different news agencies telling us how dangerous it is in Nicaragua, how great it is in the United States after all the propaganda, after all the marketing, after we hear all these different variables and we're asked to, you know, or tasked with evaluating a million little things. This one indicator is very hard to hide from that the people who live in Nicaragua and the people who live in America have a very different rate of seeing their futures as being a positive thing. There are still a lot of factors that go into that. But one of the things that's very surprising is that in general, we consider the United States, even though their healthcare system in general is very poor, we normally assume or believe that their health, their mental health care is rather good. The United States prides itself on having a very developed mental health ecosystem. And Nicaragua, admittedly, is a place that has struggled a lot with this and does not provide a lot of mental care for people. There are some social fallbacks, but they are few and far between. There are psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists, but they do not represent the, the percentage of the population that you would have in the United States. The number of people who have regular access to them can, can seek treatment is, is just not as high. And the number of social programs that exist to help catch people who are having having a mental uh, health crisis are in theory much lower. However, there are social constructs that uh, work outside of government or healthcare organizations that may be counting for some of these things. There are uh, third party things, there's all kinds of stuff. And the United States also has the potential risk and there is a lot of theories that say that a lot of the mental health uh, mechanisms are actually dangerous and create a dependency on the mental health frameworks and actually put people at more risk and the push to get people onto drugs or to get them into programs or to get them into what is essentially being incarcerated are all things that may contribute heavily to a deterioration in mental health and certainly can lead to suicidal tendencies. So it's hard to say exactly what causes trends like this, but this is one of the most important trends that you can look at because whatever factors are going to apply to the majority of the population are generally going to apply to you. But here's my, and now this is where we're going to take an objective number and I'm going to add something very subjective to it. When we talk about people who are migrating, we talk about, well, there's you know people in Nicaragua who want to get to the United States for opportunity, and there's people from the United States who want to get to Nicaragua for different opportunities, and 
migration happens both directions. We know that many Nicaraguans move north. I am proof that Americans move south. And we know many Americans who have done this with us or, you know, in our area. When Nicaraguans are moving towards the United States, they have a tendency that they are looking for specific things that are given to them by the United States, meaning jobs, economic opportunities, and so forth. Those things are provided by the nation in a way where they're, they're sort of provided. When we are assuming what the problems are, and we're, again, this is subjective, so I'm, I'm adding in some opinion here. When we're looking at the things that we think would lead towards depression or, or suicidal tendencies in Nicaragua, we're assuming that some of those leading indicators include a lack of employment, low economic outlook for the future, a bleak long-term financial outlook, although that is looking partially decent. The, the amount of that that is visible to the population is relatively low. If you lived here, you may have a far more bleak outlook on the future of your income opportunities than I would have for those same people. And probably the reality is somewhere in the middle. I'm probably over-optimistic. They are probably over-pessimistic. But those factors are things that if you, as an expat moving to Nicaragua, we assume that you would come here and not take on those burdens, right? If, if there's a lack of employment, well, it doesn't matter to you because you already have your money from somewhere else or you're working somewhere else. You're, you're not greatly impacted negatively by the things that we assume, just assuming, are causing what to a suicide rate there is in Nicaragua. There's always a baseline suicide rate that is just caused by, by mental health that cannot be avoided short of physically protecting people from themselves, right? But there's a certain amount that you can't blame on the country whatsoever, and it would be just the slightest bit lower than Venezuela's numbers, right? Which are about, in, must be about as low as we can theoretically get, but certainly no country is actually as low as you can theoretically get. And when you're looking at the United States, we're assuming that the people who are going to the United States are going from a position of having fewer things that would make them less suicidal to a place that, I'm sorry, to make them more things, going to a place that solves those issues. So we think when we're looking at migrations that the population moving into the United States is going to be reducing, based on the, the things that they're moving for, their tendency towards uh, depression or suicide. And the people who are moving uh, from the north down to Nicaragua are not going to be taking on what depression or suicidal uh, uh, factors exist here at least not the dramatic ones. Of course, there's some factors always somewhere. It can be as simple as, well, there's a plant that grows here and it affects people and no one has, no one's figured that out, right? We don't know what little things like that play into, into the human psyche. Hopefully science will catch up and give us some benefits over time, but we don't have that, right? When we're looking at these big things. So when we're looking at purely the big numbers that apply to the, the local populations, Nicar whatever Nicaragua is doing, whether it's cultural, historic, whatever, is vastly outperforming the United States in, in a really positive way. When we're looking as expats, this is important. The things that we believe create our depression, the, the leading factors in creating our depression from the United States, when we come to Nicaragua, we shed them. And the same when Nicaraguans move to the United States, they shed them, they believe, right? We think we're giving up these things. So it's really interesting that the migration has a tendency to make things better. So if you're looking at moving to Nicaragua, and, and of course, if you're looking as Nicaraguans looking to move to the United States, I, I think this actually goes both ways. Like, it's really interesting. But if you're uh, watching my channel, you're watching in English, you're interested in moving to Nicaragua, and you're saying, okay, so Nicaragua just automatically has this much better rate. That's fantastic. But how does it affect me? This is where we get subjective. I think what we'll find is that as an expat moving to Nicaragua, that you benefit from the positives of Nicaragua, but mostly avoid the negatives. The economic problems, the economic outlook, the unemployment numbers, these should not matter to you at all. I know that sometimes we think on paper that they will, but in some ways they actually benefit you by having high unemployment, by having low uh, income overall. It means that your expat dollars go farther. Your buying power is stronger. Those are things that contribute to positive mental health. So as an expat moving into the country, you actually avoid the biggest expected negatives of the Nicaraguan mental health potential problems and get some benefits that are unique. And so already being a very mentally stable, happy, non-suicidal country, you may be in an even better place than that. So this objectively is really, really good 
but subjectively might be even better and logically seems like that should be the case. So these are great numbers to work with and I'm gonna do my best to post the link to the Wikipedia article down below so you can scroll through the list on your own and see where whatever country you're from or looking at going falls on the list. This is not a super definitive system, but it's very suggestive of things that if a country has a really high suicidal rate, you may want to think carefully about what that implies about the general happiness that you're likely to experience, not just for yourself, but of the people around you in the country you're moving to. Because obviously, even if it takes a lot of people who are depressed for a small number of people to commit suicide. So when that number balloons, you, you expect to have massive amounts of very, very noticeable impact to you in the population. If you live in a place that's very, just everyone's unhappy, you're going to sense that. If you're living in a place where people tend to be very happy, you're going to sense that. And I do want to point out, growing up in the United States, living here in Nicaragua, I've never heard of anyone committing suicide. I'm absolutely sure it happens but it's not something that we're faced with. We're not confronted with that as part of a day-to-day -day reality. But growing up in the United States, I had a number of people that I went to high school with committed suicide. We had a number of people in, in high schools around us that committed suicide. It was such a normal thing. It didn't happen every day, but we would expect two or three times a year that someone we would be connected to would commit suicide. It was just a, a matter of course growing up in the United States. That's a really surprising number. Now that I've lived abroad, it's amazing to think that that was something we considered still awful but kind of normal that we just, well, yeah, so, you know, one or two people from each class is going to commit suicide on any given year. What? Why? That doesn't make any sense. That should not be the case. And I don't know anywhere else that's like that. And now knowing the statistic, there are extremely few places that would be like that. So I think this is a, a good tool to use. And, and I want to make it into a broad thing. Yes, we're mostly comparing the United States and Nicaragua here. But the, this is just a general tool for relocation that you can use when you're when you're evaluating different regions of the world, specific areas. So use the objective numbers and get some real insight and then apply some logic and say, how do we think the things that are likely contributing factors, important factors, where I'm coming from and going to, how does my expatting or digital nomadry or whatever affect how those things affect me. Do I bring problems with me? Does the place I go make it worse than if I had grown up there? Or is it like coming to Nicaragua where had I been born in Nicaragua, I'd actually have more problems, but as an expat, I'm actually shielded from them in quite a way. And so probably get an even happier experience than the people who already have a very happy experience with a very low suicide rate. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel and the work that we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, please like, subscribe, share on social media, tell someone about the show, let them know, get another viewer hooked on what we do here, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'm going to do my best popping up on the screen four videos. If you pick one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, all of that tells the algorithm that you like the show, and then it should keep showing you more of it.